it is a scandal that the international community is allowing such a place to continue and that this situation continues not because of an insurmountable humanitarian problem but because of political divergences. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, columnist for The Post. Today, it's a special pleasure to have Peter Moore, the president of the International Committee for the Red Cross, as our guest. The ICRC goes places around the world that few organizations do uh, and saves lives in, in many places that most of us haven't even heard of. But uh, Peter, it's a special pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me, David. It's uh, great to see you again. Good, good to see you. The ICRC, as I as I suggested, uh, has a window on conflicts around the world, and I want to ask you about a number of them. I'd like to start with the conflict in Gaza, the 11-day war that ended last month. Your representatives have been on the ground seeing the extent of the damage and the need for reconstruction and relief. Give us a sense of what your people have seen in Gaza. Well, one thing is what uh, my colleagues on the ground see. And of course, as in any war, there is a uh, massive destruction uh, of, of building, of infrastructure, uh, which my colleagues see. What is more important, I think, is what they see and hear in conversations with people in Israel and in Gaza. And this is the psychological impact of this warfare. Uh, which has lasted uh, more than a week. It's the day and night insecurity, the trauma uh, of uh, men, women, children who have been exposed to it. And I think that's what uh, worries us sometimes even more than the physical destruction which uh, we witness. And Peter, let me ask you to follow that up. What should the world community do about the mental health? The consequences of these conflicts for uh, people in Gaza, people in Israel, but people in all the conflict zones that you monitor. How should we think about that? Well, there is a, a kind of an obvious and easy answer, and the obvious and easy answer is uh, these: all these conflicts need political solutions. Political solutions need sustained diplomatic efforts to bring parties uh, parties to conflict together. It's uh, finding a way uh, below, beyond warfare, which allows communities to live together. But of course, the situation is, is more complex and finding political solutions, as we all know, is, uh, is not easy. What is even more important is to find at least pathways to those solutions. It's building confidence and trust uh, through the respect of international humanitarian law, for instance. It's uh, giving a perspective to those who are trapped in between front lines. And this is something which can be sort of uh, decomposed in, in doable steps while finding a political solution is the sort of normal reflex that we all, humanitarians and many others have because at the end of the day we know that we can only mitigate uh, the effects of conflicts we can eventually uh, stabilize situations but a real pathway out of conflict can only come with uh, engagement of powers with uh, nudging local uh, representatives uh, nudging local uh, uh, leaders uh, into negotiating uh, peaceful settlements. It's finding uh, equitable ways of dealing with some of the developmental, some of the uh, social economic discrepancies on the ground. It's a larger agenda which needs the whole international community to work together and not uh, to work against each other. 
the fact that we are confronted today with massive power competition gives options to local actors, to regional actors, to choose between the ones or the other. I think uh, the complexity of the dynamic of violence has gone beyond structured groups. Uh, we see increasingly inter-community violence on the ground, so sustained political efforts, but also reconciliation efforts in societies are absolutely critical. A good example of the complexity of conflict is the war in Syria, now 10 years old. You and I have talked about it uh, in, the, in the past. Uh, you recently were in Syria. You were visiting the Al Hol refugee camp. We had that striking footage uh, at the beginning of our program today in which you referred to the situation there as a scandal. There are, uh, by my count, over 60,000 uh, refugees, some of them ISIS families living in those camps. You were quoted in something I saw, Peter, as saying, this is really the place where hope is going to die. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, child protection crisis with which we're confronted today. Tell us about what you saw on the ground so that our viewers have some sense of this place so far away. And then think with us about what to, to, can be done about it uh, so that, that we don't have a generation of people who will make war all over again. Well, one thing, uh, again, is, of course, the very dire situations for the people living in the hall. And as you rightly say, David, that's uh, uh, first and foremost, women and children of those fighters who, Islamic State group fighters who have fought the war till the bitter end in Burgos. Uh, they have come uh, to our whole camp. They are there, have been there for the last two years, which means that for the kids in those camps, and it's more than 40,000 children uh, below 12 years of age, which haven't really seen uh, sustained schooling efforts, which have lived in tent and makeshift uh, uh, provisional uh, habitat. It's a very difficult situation. It's a place full of violence uh, within the camp. It's a very dire, again, physical environment in which uh, these kids and uh, women are growing up, which alone is a big problem. What is even more difficult for me to accept is the fact that uh, there is no process of either screening or adjudication of those who are in the camps, which would give them a perspective of how they can get out and whether they are adjudicated, whether they are eventually liberated because there is uh, no proof of any uh, violations of uh, of laws and and fundamental uh, provisions of uh, international law having been violated by them, and so there is no perspective of due process, which I think is almost as difficult to accept as the dire uh, situation in the camp are. What can you do in those situations? Of course, on the one side. And that's what we and uh, a couple of other humanitarian organizations are doing. We can bring uh, humanitarian assistance. We do tens of thousands of meals every day uh, for uh, those people in the camp. We can offer medical services. We can, uh, for the kids, uh, try to have a minimal form of education, schooling, psychological accompaniment for these difficult situations. So there are ways to improve the situation in the camp. But what is even more important is that the international community comes together and deals with this as an international issues and gives a perspective of uh, either uh, a legal due process form of accountability for those who have committed crimes and a perspective of uh, going back to their countries. And so uh, working diplomatically to find pathways to return those uh, who haven't committed any crimes back to their countries or being adjudicated in their countries of origin is of critical importance. So it's both. It's a 
improvement of the situation on the ground, but even more important, it's giving perspectives to return, giving perspective of due process, which are so bitterly needed. And I think where the reason why I called it a place without hope is that uh, I feel very much that the international community, uh, at least in large part, is uh, trying to zoom out these problems, their collective responsibility to deal with it. And this is what makes this situation so, uh, so, so difficult to accept. As, as you describe this, uh, Peter, it sounds almost like a version of Guantanamo Bay in, in northern Syria, where people are held without any uh, legal status whatsoever. Uh, these families, in many cases, are, are um, wives and children of people who came from other countries, including countries in Europe, to fight uh, in Syria for the Islamic State. Has there been any progress in, in uh, getting European countries to take some responsibility for repatriation of people or being involved, uh, as you say, in some uh, legal resolution of the situation? I think uh, what uh, fortunately we have seen that at least some European countries have uh, been willing to take back children uh, to reintegrate them with families uh, in their own countries and uh, some uh, members of the European Union and others uh, have been able to repatriate uh, children. It has been much more difficult with adults. It has brought us into intrinsic difficulties of separation or not separation of women and children when countries were ready either to repatriate the kids, but not necessarily the women. And so uh, there is a certain amount of consciousness of uh, countries that this is an important issue, but political consensus is still elusive to really address forcefully uh, this situation of uh, of the families of Islamic State group uh, fighters being stuck in northeast Syria. I think other countries in the world have uh, uh, partly been more uh, successful to repatriate uh, children as well as uh, family members to somehow uh, mount the radicalization program, reintegrate them in society. Uh, but it remains a big issue, which, uh, as the numbers show, we still have more than 60,000 stuck in those camp camps. And this is, of course, a huge number. And if you make a comparison to Guantanamo, it's uh, definitely much bigger numbers than ever the U.S. has dealt with uh, with regard to detention uh, in Guantanamo that we are looking at at the present moment. It's also more minors uh, and more women that the U.S. Uh, has dealt with after 9-11. It's a particularly uh, difficult uh, situation. Let's continue with this uh, roster of, of painful conflicts, uh, that is the ICRC's role, and, and we're all grateful that, that your organization steps up to these problems. I want to ask about Afghanistan. We think with U.S. Uh, troops coming home after what's been our longest war, that in some ways that conflict will ease, or at least our involvement in it. But the world doesn't work that way often. I'd like to ask you about uh, ICRC's view of what's ahead in Afghanistan, and particularly with U.S. troops gone and a very shaky situation for the for the government. What can be done in the future to protect Afghan civilians, uh, vulnerable Af Afghan women uh, who, who may face uh, new uh, uh, violations of their of their human rights? How can ICRC and other international organizations fill that vacuum that we fear lies ahead? Well, I'm not sure whether we will be able to fill uh, the vacuum. We are certainly concerned by uh, not only uh, internationals moving out uh, on the military and security side, but also, as you rightly say, NGOs. I think we continue to have 
a, an important operation in Afghanistan, focusing on providing health services to people, uh, including in Taliban and non-Taliban controlled areas. I think here again, what is badly necessary is also an internal process in Afghanistan, which would lead to a legitimate uh, government uh, with uh, an impact of uh, in, in the whole of the country. I think what we are ready to do is uh, to continue to support wherever we can through humanitarian assistance in some of the key areas uh, for which uh, we have worked over decades now to continue this support and this work. But uh, there is a real problem of lack of visibility of a possibly forgotten conflict that we see emerging in Afghanistan with less international attention, less support for social services in the country, uh, less uh, legitimacy or no legitimacy uh, immediately emerging out of the peace process for a strong Afghan government. And this is certainly uh, an issue of concern given uh, that already over the last uh, years we have seen emerging and continuing levels of violence in the country, which at the end of the day haven't been a we haven't been able to curb and no intervention of the international community has been able to curb. Unfortunately, we have seen growing uh, numbers of civilian victims over the last four or five years. And uh, I fear that if here again, a domestic strong uh, political process does not lead to uh, legitimate governance in Afghanistan, we will see a protracted conflict continuing uh, and uh, some of the protection work from women and children and civilians on which we have been focusing in the past uh, being at least as difficult as we saw it in the last couple of years. So continued engagement is of critical importance and we will try the best we can to continue and hopefully also with the support of the international community scale our response to the underlying social and development and developmental problems in the country. But violence uh, uh, is always the biggest danger of uh, being disruptive for uh, those efforts that we are undertaking. Just a small question that, that I wonder about, I suspect many of our viewers do. Will, will the ICRC be able to remain in, in Taliban controlled areas? And are you in those, those areas now able to operate? We are able to operate at the present moment. I think over the last 20, 25 years, we have been able to establish uh, working relationships with uh, uh, local uh, Taliban. We have been in close contact with the negotiating delegation in Doha and uh, with the leadership of the Taliban movement as we continued to have uh, strong and continuous engagement with the Afghan government. So we do have uh, together also with the Afghan Red Crescent Society, which is present in the whole of the country, quite a reach and the possibility to act. On the other hand, this is a war-torn society and the country which has been shaken by war and violence. And uh, I think it's just a huge challenge to keep up and to keep basic social services from health to education to water and sanitation in uh, some of the regions of Afghanistan up and negotiating conditions uh, to bring assistance and to have safe possibilities to deliver, to deliver humanitarian assistance in the country will be a continued huge challenge, but contacts are here. What is maybe of uh, quite a concern to an organization like mine is that uh, the issue is not only between the present Afghan government and the Taliban, it is also that the Taliban are contested by even more radical groups and we will have to uh, see how the political dynamics on the ground develop to continue to maintain the accesses and relationships that we uh, have been able to build and to continue over the last couple of years.
One of the terrible things, uh, Peter, that you and your group uh, know better than anyone is that over the last year and a half in these conflict areas, there's been the additional threat of the COVID-19 pandemic. Could you just tell us br briefly uh, what uh, conflict means in terms of uh, limiting the ability to deal with, with the pandemic and the healthcare costs? Well, it was one of my striking experience over the last uh, year to see that while the whole attention in the international community was uh, dealing with COVID, conflict and violence continued unabatedly and the protractedness of many situations with, in which we were working of impact of climate change, impact of violence, structural poverty, governance issues with which we have been dealing in the past were compounded by uh, the health impact of COVID, but also by the secondary impact uh, of COVID, meaning that economies have been heavily disrupted, in particular the informal sector in so many countries in which uh, we operate. The informal economy has been heavily disrupted by COVID-19 and in particular by the measures government legitimately have taken in order to curb the pandemic. But I have been uh, really shaken and impressed to see what it means on the ground when governments in some of the conflict regions take measures to curb the pandemic. Uh, it has massive impact on the weak informal economic sector. It kicks out of income possibilities, uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of people. The World Bank has estimated that we have accumulated more than 120 or 150 million people who have slided uh, below the poverty line uh, with COVID. So it is really a uh, an additional challenge on top of an already uh, protracted situations uh, with, in which climate change, poverty and violence uh, have met over the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years and which have produced these hyper -conf, uh, fragile situations and complex situation with which we are dealing. COVID hasn't helped and and even has accelerated and accentuated some of the inequities and inequalities with which we have been dealing. So uh, we have unfortunately seen massive negative impact, even if the health impact of COVID is more difficult to assess in some of the conflict regions because we simply lack the figures and the statistics which would allow us to have an accurate image on what the health impact of COVID and the pandemic was. Let's talk for a moment about keeping uh, your uh, people, uh, healthcare workers in general, safe uh, in these conflict zones, uh, in, in the fragile uh, areas where, where you operate. There's some shocking numbers that are gathered. One group called the uh, Safeguarding Health in Conflict coalition and another set of statistics ga gathered by Amnesty International shows a h horrifying vulnerability of healthcare workers to attacks uh, in these areas. What can be done to, to, to make the people who are trying to save lives uh, safer themselves? Is that something that you, you have any thoughts for us about? Well, we uh, have been really uh, uh, shaken by the continuous attack over the last couple of years. And while we have seen attacks on health and healthcare facilities, healthcare workers, ambulances increase in conflict settings over the last couple of years, uh, which has led also to respective resolutions in response to this development in the Security Council, that this trend unfortunately has even been accentuated with, by and through COVID. It has been, I hope, at the beginning in, in the initial phase of the pandemic, that uh, pandemic would eventually bring sense to belligerents and to societies and keep violence away from healthcare workers. But it has rather uh, 
exacerbated violence around healthcare and healthcare delivery, uh, delivery of healthcare services because of the scarcity of some of these services, the increasing uh, uh, difficult competition within society of getting uh, some of these health services into communities. And this has rather exacerbated violence. We could uh, see and statistically prove that COVID has further uh, in addition to conflict related attack on attacks on healthcare workers has led to even more attacks coming very often from families, from uh, communities uh, to healthcare workers and health facilities. But at the end of the day, competing over very scarce health services in some of these fragile contexts. What can be done? I think uh, uh, we need first to scale up the services, which uh, uh, rightly so communities ask uh, from their health systems. And then, of course, uh, it needs uh, a broad campaign to sensitize communities of the strategic importance of health services for communities. Uh, in order to prevent and curb. We need also, and we have done over the last couple of uh, years, to bring the health community, health workers together in order to help them protect, to train and educate them on how to deal with these complex situations. I think a lot can be done at the level of communities, at the level of healthcare workers, but also politically to uh, really uh, respond to this uh, awful trend, which has been accelerating the spiral towards the bottom of delivering healthcare services in very fragile and difficult circumstances. In our last few minutes, I want to talk about, about money, which is what's needed to pay for the good work that you and, and others do. You and the, the Red Crescent uh, movement have, have called for a nearly $3 billion, $3 tri uh, billion program to deal with pervasive inequalities uh, that have been revealed by the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, so that uh, uh, proposal is on the table. Your own organization, the ICRC, which you've talked about uh, so powerfully today, uh, you said last December is, is uh, badly underfunded in terms of the work that it needs to do. Has that funding situation Im improved and, and how can you uh, get the money that you're able to use uh, so effectively to, to keep doing your job? Well, we have been uh, generously funded uh, uh, largely by OECD countries over the last couple of years. But of course, with the spike in uh, needs that we have seen with increasing fragile situations that we have talked about, David, uh, the gap between our resources and the needs has increased and this is true for the whole humanitarian sector. I think uh, what we need is uh, a broader community of states shouldering uh, the bill. It's probably a new deal on how to support some of the essential frontline work that humanitarians are doing. It's mobilizing also capital in the international institutions from the World Bank to the regional development banks. We are in talks with the World Bank in particular to see how the bank and even the fund can create facilities able to deal with some of the disruptive instabilities uh, with which countries are dealing today. I think it is important also to look for new financial instruments, participation of the private sector, new financial instruments. And then it is important at the same time that we do not use the money to move people further into dependencies. And I think this is maybe the critical balance to find. On the one side, we need more money, but we also need to encourage people to find productive activities much earlier than maybe uh, we have done in the past in order uh, to move them faster. 
out of the worst crisis, which always comes with dependencies. People don't want to be dependent from handouts of the international community. And so the delicate message that I'm giving tonight is that yes, on the one side, we need to be able to cope with emergencies. We need to have more, more states uh, more generously uh, participating in the global burden sharing, uh, more international organization participating uh, in this burden sharing. And at the same time, we need to find income generating activities earlier on to help people stand on their own feet. And this is basically the best strategy I would suggest to narrow the gap uh, which you have alluded to. Peter Moore, uh, president of the International Committee for the Red Cross, um, uh, extraordinary organization. Uh, thank you for sharing with us uh, some descriptions of the work that, that you do that most of us uh, never hear about or are aware, about, aware of. Uh, thanks for being with us today, Peter. Thanks for having me, really appreciate it. So uh, thanks for, for, for watching us today. I'll be back tomorrow at one o'clock in the afternoon with New Yorker writer Lawrence Wright to talk about his new book, The Plague Year, America in the Time of COVID. It's a powerful book. I hope you'll join us for the, for the session.